Several aspects of Bernard Riemann's Theory of Abelian Functions, published in 1857, are of crucial importance today for understanding economics and scientific method more broadly by allowing the true nature of human economy to be considered and discussed without the sickening effects of using deadly mathematical language. While abelian functions, named after the Norwegian Niels Abel, certainly are mathematical, Riemann saw in them an analog for the continuing development of human thought, and treated them, ironically, not as mathematical objects, but as physical geometrical relationships. In doing so, he defended the key concept of metaphor in language, including in mathematical language. In this presentation, we'll see how Riemann's work helps us conceptualize qualitative transformation as being the primary substance of economic progress, and how it lets us think of ourselves as embodying the continuous development that expresses itself in such shifts. This will take place in two broad sections. First, we'll go through the concept of potential and Riemann's use of what he called Dirichlet's principle. Second, we'll look at Riemann's treatment of abelian functions themselves. And then, we'll conclude with some applications to economics and theology. In his work on studying the power of motion, Gottfried Leibniz introduced two important terms, vis viva, meaning living force, and vis mortua, meaning dead force. Living force is seen in the movement of an object, such as the power of a baseball bat to change the motion of a baseball. And Leibniz famously showed that, contrary to Descartes' assertions, the measure of the power in herring and moving objects was proportional not to their speed, but to the square of their speed. In contrast to such living forces, Leibniz considered a dead force as one which could come to life. For example, a skier at the top of a slope can develop speed as he descends, and a bow ready to fire an arrow has a dead force that comes to life when the archer releases the string. For the case of raised objects, their elevation is a measure of their dead force. The farther they can fall, the greater the speed they'll reach, and the higher they're raised, the more effort was required to get them there. A topographic map is a measure of dead force by measuring elevation. Here, take a look at this island landscape. If we mark off lines for the paths that stay at a constant level, we could then view it from overhead and we see what is known as a topographic map. The lines of constant elevation are known as contour lines, and they indicate elevation on the map, just like lines of latitude indicate how far north or south you are. If we were to set a ball on the ground on one of these contour lines, it would start to roll perpendicular to the line, since it wants to roll down, not stay at the same level. We'll come back to this. A major development of Leibniz's concept of dead force was made by Carl Gauss, who reintroduced it by the name of potential, which is the name that we use today. Its use can best be shown by an example. Here you have a simulation of a comet coming into a planetary system. According to Newton, the comet must be thought of as being pulled on by the star, the planets, all the asteroids. As you can see, it gets pretty complicated to think about all the forces this way. Instead, Gauss looked at the space of the planetary system as having a certain shape, and the comet simply moved around in the space the same way a ball would move on the terrain that we saw earlier on the topographic map. Here, the different bands represent the potential, the dead force, just like the contour lines did on our topographic map. They are a more general idea of height. Now here we have the comet, and it simply moves in this shape space, without considering a large number of individual forces. As we bring the camera down, you can see a representation of the star and the planets making small gravity wells. This might be familiar to you from other videos you've seen about Einstein and curved spacetime. But there's something missing here. 
contour curves are fine for a two-dimensional surface, like the surface of the Earth or the ecliptic plane of the planetary system, but what about all of three-dimensional space? Instead of contour lines, we have equipotential surfaces. All of the spots on any one of these surfaces has the same potential, the same dead force. Now, let's take a look at magnetism. Magnetic compasses were used for navigation before it was known that the Earth itself has a magnetic field. Some people simply thought that the North Star was itself magnetic. The hypothesis that the Earth is a giant magnet came from William Gilbert, whose work helped to inspire Kepler. Now, measurements of magnetism from around the world revealed that the field didn't correspond to a simple magnet. Tobias Meyer said that the Earth's field must be off-center and crooked. And Hanstein hypothesized that there were two magnets inside the Earth. As Gauss entered the field of Earth magnetism himself, he said that everyone was approaching the problem the wrong way. Rather than starting with the hypothesis of magnets, they were first required to figure out what the overall magnetic field was. Without such knowledge, hypothesizing about magnets deep within the Earth was just shooting in the dark. Gauss proved that actually it was impossible to know what was happening inside the Earth. Any magnetism inside would have the same effect on us outside the body of the Earth as if the magnets were spread upon the surface of the Earth itself. That is, unless you make measurements deep inside the Earth, you can't actually know what's going on inside. All you can know is the field itself. Being freed from the need to think about some configuration of magnets, Gauss treated the magnetic field as a field, discovering how to use limited observations to map the field as a whole, and how to make more observations to refine it. Here's a world map that Gauss produced of magnetic declination. The lines on the map indicate the difference between geographic north and the magnetic north that you'd see on your compass. So again, with potential as his tool, Gauss was able to look at entireties as entireties, as gestalts, as wholes, rather than as an aggregation of parts. On the economic front, how might this be useful in thinking of Nawapa as a new platform? rather than simply as pieces of infrastructure. Lejeune Dirichlet built on Gauss's work in his own lectures on potential. He made another important discovery, very similar to Gauss's, that has become known as Dirichlet's principle. Let's take a look at a whole space filled by potential. Here we've got an electric field with two positive charges near the center and a negative one near us. Now that we've drawn in the potential sheets, we're going to focus on a region of the space that does not include electric charges themselves. So the change you're seeing here is just restricting the region of sheets that we're showing. Nothing is actually changing. Now, here's what Dirichlet says. He says that the shape of all of those sheets inside the sphere is completely determined if we know the potential on the surface of the sphere. That is, simply knowing the boundary completely determines the shape of what lies inside the whole volume. Dirichlet gave the condition for the internal potential that corresponded to a given surface. He said that the shape of the potential minimizes the total force inside. That is, least action is a characteristic of potential fields. This might seem minor or technical, but it's a very important concept because it changes the idea of what it means to know something. Do you have to know every possible detail about something to understand it fully? What are the determining characteristics such that if you knew them, you'd know everything about its behavior? Riemann applied this physical principle when studying mathematical complex functions, including those of Abel, which we'll come to in the next section. 
While physicists familiar with electricity and magnetism thought the concept made sense, mathematicians attacked Riemann's later use of Dirichlet's principle. They basically said that Riemann had to say what that minimum force was, not just that it existed. But think, aren't there some ideas that you only communicate by describing what they do, rather than giving a description? To not allow that, is the same as saying that metaphor is not allowed. This is a difficult issue, and we're going to get at it using riddles. Don't worry, we will come back to Dirichlet's principle. All right, put your thinking cap on, because here are some riddles. Here's the first one. You see it both in field and town. It cannot get up, but often falls down. Though you see it both in field and in town, it can't get up, but it often falls down. Here's a second one. A barrel of water weighs 20 pounds. What must you add to make it weigh 15? A barrel of water weighs 20 pounds. What must you add to make it weigh 15? One more. A third one here. Two legs it has, and this is really neat. Only at rest with the ground will they meet. Two legs it has, and this is quite neat. Only at rest with the ground will they meet. And one last one here. What is black when bought, red when used, and gray when thrown away? What is black when bought, red when used, and gray when thrown away? So take some time to think about these. Go ahead and hit pause to give yourself some time. It's important that you try to figure them out, or the rest won't make sense. Okay, hopefully you've got some guesses. The first answer is rain, which falls all the time but never gets up. For the second one, the barrel, you'd have to add holes to the barrel to make it weigh less. On the third, a wheelbarrow has two legs, and they only touch the ground when the wheelbarrow is at rest. What's black when bought, red when used, and gray when thrown away? The answer is coal. So, maybe you got some of those, maybe you didn't, but now that you know the answers, they're not themselves complicated, although the way they were described with riddles was. Now for another riddle. What only runs when it is cold, and stops as soon as it is told. What only runs when it is cold, and stops as soon as it is told. Again, pause the video to think about it. Did you get it? Well, the answer is not your nose, which runs when it's cold, but doesn't stop when it's told. At least mine doesn't. And although there are some complicated answers you might give, like a well-behaved sled dog, there is no answer. This wasn't a real riddle, although it sounds like one. These conditions don't correspond to any simple thing. I wanted to show that it's possible to phrase something that sounds like a riddle without actually having an answer. But earlier, we did have several riddles that had simple answers. In each case, the riddle wasn't necessary to describe the object in question. For example, if you wanted to borrow a wheelbarrow, you wouldn't go to your neighbor and ask him for a thing with two legs which touch the ground only when it is at rest. At least, I hope you wouldn't ask that way. Instead, you'd just say that you want a wheelbarrow. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there some things that you can only say as riddles, that you couldn't say more simply? That is, are there some concepts that you can only describe by what they do? by saying the conditions they fulfill, rather than just saying what they are. Well, if you've ever had the experience of sharing a big idea with someone to whom it is new, you know that you can't just say it by name. You have to cause the other person's mind to generate the idea anew, in a process that's similar to telling riddles. The thought must be created from within their minds, provoked by your outside action, but not inserted or given by you. How about poems? Poems usually aren't very straightforward. 
and a good poem says something that could not be transformed into simple prose. While bad poems are like riddles without answers, if you've worked on Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, it's clear that Shakespeare does have a point. And although you might think about it or discuss the sonnet in prose, the best way to convey that particular thought is through the sonnet itself. The same is the case with great music. It often doesn't require words to make its point, but it is precise, saying something that could not have been put into simple words. So, metaphor. Metaphor is a form of negative communication, where a specific idea is conveyed, but not by stating it directly. Instead, the conditions that the idea must fulfill, which are usually paradoxical until the idea is formed, these are used to impel the other person to develop the new thought themselves. Truly new ideas are always like this. They require a new way of thinking, not just a new object-like thought. They're more like a new motion than a new thing. Now return to Dirichlet's principle and potential. Keeping up our analogy here, the surface conditions of the sphere have only one answer, the shape of the internal potential, just as the conditions of a riddle have an answer that they imply. So the surface is like the riddle, and the internal shape is the answer. Riemann treats all mathematical functions this way, not as formulas, but as transitive verbs, as that which does something, looking at what their characteristic activity is rather than their description or their formula. And by doing this, he allows metaphors into his mathematics, rather than banishing them as uptight, symbol-minded mathematicians do. Riemann's approach with abelian functions is to abandon formulas as much as possible. Now, looking at metaphor and economics, the new discoveries of principle that shift human society and economy forward as if by leaps are of this nature. They are a solution to paradoxes presented by the senses, solutions which lie outside the domain of the senses in the domain of the causes of what later then appear to our senses. They are the unseen movers whose effects present themselves to us as scientific paradoxes, as scientific riddles. Economic and political forecasting and policy depends not on amassing huge amounts of data, although that may sometimes be required. Instead, a developed knowledge of the determining conditions is what's important. Next, we'll look at the most essential characteristic of economics, the seemingly discontinuous jumps that make up economic progress in the next segment.